Uh, so uh, yeah, thanks for having me, first of all. And uh, uh, thanks Carl, Carl for this uh, like uh, great talk. I was like kind of generally aware there was this whole ecosystem of, of like uh, documentation uh, with uh, like in Rust, but um, haven't had a chance to get into it. And uh, like, I'm still at the stage of being blown away by markdown inside comments. So um, uh, very cool. Thank you for that talk. Um, and yeah, so um, uh, today I'm going to talk to you about a project that I've been working on for the past six months or so. Um, Mosaic is a terminal multiplexer and workspace written in Rust. Um, a terminal multiplexer, multiplexer, for those who do not know, is like uh, uh, an application that runs inside your terminal session and allows you to split your terminal session into several uh, pings, each one of them a terminal. Um, it could, can also allow you to have like different tabs like you have in the browser um, and uh, also to um, maybe sometimes kind of detach from your current session, close your terminal window and open a new terminal window and reattach to that session. Uh, for those of you who have used Emux or Stream in the past, both of them are terminal multiplexers, and uh, Mosaic is the new one we are building right now in Rust. Um, it's important for me to start by saying uh, that um, I use like the plural sometime in this uh, presentation because this project does not belong to me, uh, not just because ownership is theft, but uh, because there is a whole team uh, um, around this project. We are an open source project. We are eight now. Um, and while I started this project, um, I see myself now as uh, part of the team. So shout out to uh, all the Mosaic team. Um, so in order to tell like the idea behind Mosaic, because it is not uh, just a terminal multiplexer, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what brought me to build it. And for that, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So. Um, I started out my development career in operations, uh, where I was a DevOps engineer. And uh, most of the development I did was uh, like writing Perl and Bash scripts. So uh, the uh, like editor I used in order to do that was Vim. Um, over the years, as I moved uh, away from uh, like DevOps into more traditional development, like software development roles, then um, I still kind of stuck with Vim, and uh, this is the editor I use today to write any language, like uh, JavaScript, Rust, um, uh, even some Python sometimes. Um, so I kind of adapted um, a sort of uh, system around, uh, around Vim in order to allow me to uh, use it as an editor and also do uh, other stuff. Um, at first, I used uh, Tmux, to have multiple like Vim pings and also a command line and such with the uh, ping splitting. Uh, and then I eventually moved to uh, i3. In case you don't know it, it's uh, like, uh, I think it's called a tiling window manager. I saw it as being taking Tmux and moving it to the desktop. So I'm able to open multiple terminal windows, each one of them having uh, like the Vim editor open, uh, command line like I was able in Tmux, but also having a browser window and such. Um, this also allowed me to build like kind of an automation around it in order to have uh, like automated tasks of having one pane, spawning other panes um, and such. Um, and um, yeah, I, I guess uh, I, I'll, I want to show this to you. So this is what I'm talking about. Um, this is i3. Uh, we see here three terminal windows. Um, Aram, I'm sorry, I have to inter. Aram, I'm sorry, I have yes. to interrupt you. You yes. just share your slides, I so we only share. see your uh -huh. slides. I see. So, I did not so maybe you should screen. share your entire screen because I think from what you are telling us is yeah. we should see something different. You are you are very right. So let me just. Uh, yeah, you have just presented the Chrome browser. Maybe you have to stop sh screen sharing again and mm -hmm. reshare the screen. Just a sec. So, sorry about this. 
Absolutely no problem. Technical difficulties. Yeah, we will. Yeah, yeah. Um, we will master them. <laughs> so, um, let's see. Now I'm going to share my desktop. Do you see my desktop now? Yes, we see the desktop. That's Amazing. correct. So just let me bring the presentation back into it. Yeah, we see okay. the presentation. And now you can see me switching tabs, right? Yes, uh, we Amazing. see that. Works perfectly fine. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you very much. Okay, so, um, yeah, as I was saying, uh, this is kind of my desktop uh, environment right now. Uh, we can see three terminal windows here. Um, the, like in the middle, we see uh, like an editor Vim window. And on the bottom, we see a, a terminal that I can use in order to run tests and uh, like uh, look around the file system and such. And on the left, we see it's an application, in case you don't know it, it's called Ranger. It's a terminal application running inside the terminal that uh, uh, like lets you explore like the, the file system. I can go in, go back, go in directories and such. And then uh, I can also like uh, open files. What happens here is that Ranger uh, kind of starts uh, like a bash script, which talks to um, uh, like I3, figures out the uh, like the arrangement of the windows and figures out where to open like a new uh, a new terminal pane. Um, so you can do that uh, like um, uh, with a few things. So this is what I used for development for a while, um, and um, so. This was nice, it's good, it's productive for me, but the problem is that like moving to a different um, uh, like computer is something I fear. Uh, this is, as I alluded, this is kind of a, a soup of bash scripts right now. Um, so it's a highly configured environment that's highly specific and not very transferable to other machines, not to mention other people. If I want to like to, or if someone sees this and says, hey, this is cool, how do I work like this too? So this brought me to create Mosaic, uh, which is uh, getting back on topic. Um, about six months ago, um, I, uh, like, I quit my job um, for other reasons. And I decided, instead of uh, immediately looking for another one, to sort of take this vision I have, this uh, um, uh, 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 kind of development environment that I created for myself, and to um, uh, like formalize it. By formalizing it, I mean to create uh, an infrastructure that would allow me to describe this terminal and this, sorry, this um, a development environment um, in a like configuration file, like a YAML file that would be brief um, and would uh, like I would be able to transfer it to any other computer running that same infrastructure. Um, so this is the basic idea behind Mosaic. And this is my goal with Mosaic. Um, I think once uh, we create this sort of infrastructure that we already have, um, then I will be able to use it in order to uh, uh, fulfill my needs. And other developers would be able to use it in order to build like their development environment um, or operations environments or have like teams use it as uh, a tool for collaboration. Um, so um, we'll get more into like the, um, uh, the vision, what we can do about it later. Um, but uh, now, like the first thing I would like to talk about is uh, like get into more of the technical side because this is a rough meetup after all. Um, to talk a little bit uh, about how a terminal multiplexer actually works. Multiplexer here is in parentheses because um, uh, First, I want to talk about how a terminal actually works. Um, after we do that, and we're kind of on the same page uh, about uh, like the product we're talking about, then I want to talk about uh, the internal architecture of Mosaic and uh, how the different parts of the application of the application communicate with themselves. Um, and after that, I'm going to talk about the plugin system that. Uh, we built for Mosaic. Uh, we uh, used WebAssembly to build this plugin system. Um, this would allow any developer to like write a plugin for all of this in any compiled language, be it Rust, Go, uh, assembly script, or anything. 
Um, and to have that uh, be kind of a small applet within the application. For example, um, if you've seen the Ranger, the file explorer that I've seen before, we, our first plugin is a clone of Ranger that would allow us to run uh, something like that within pane without having it to actually having like, without it being uh, forced to actually be installed on the computer that is running it. Um, after that, I'm going to talk about the status of the project right now, uh, like uh, what problems we are facing and uh, like what sort of challenges we want to solve. Um, this is in case because this is an open source project and as I said, multiple people are working on it. If this is something that interests you, then uh, like these will be like a, a, a nice bulletin list of places you can like insert yourself in the project. So um, I want to show you the project itself and uh, how it is now. And before I do that, I will mention that um, uh, Mosaic is kind of in the late early stages. So uh, it's not 100% stable. I use it myself as part of my IDE. Um, uh, like uh, I use Mosaic in order to develop Mosaic, um, but it's not like 100%. 100%. Um, so we are stabilizing it, but um, like, please forgive me if this crashes. So once you clone the project, um, you do a cargo run, and uh, then we see like immediately you get a command line, which is your default command line, mine, uh, like the shell I'm using is fish. Um, we get a command line and as you can see here, I'll do the zoom annotate stuff. I always like that zoom opens like the annotation thing on a completely different screen. Um, back. Okay. So here on the bottom, we can see the status bar. Um, so the status bar um, is part of the default layout of Mosaic. An interesting thing is that this, the status bar is, is a plugin. It was written in Rust, but compiled to WebAssembly um, and uh, then imported by default, uh, like as part of the default layout uh, into Rust, um, into, into Mosaic, sorry. <laughs> So um, here um, it shows us like the key bindings so that we don't have to remember all of the things that uh, uh, we can do. And I'll clear here, so Zoom to give me my mouse back. And uh, yeah, so uh, if I do control G, it gives us like all, uh, uh, all of our current uh, capabilities. We are able to split the window uh, vertically to uh, split it horizontally. Uh, we are able to do all the terminal stuff, open a Vim window, like scroll through it, and of course use the most important uh, uh, like command line application. Um, this is Mosaic right now, kind of similar to Tmux, but uh, that's because we're looking for uh, like, Tmux is our infrastructure layer, as I mentioned. So the first thing we're kind of doing is kind of have a feature parity with it to be able to uh, like do all the things that it does and build on top of it. So um, moving on, um, I'm going to talk, as I said, about how a terminal uh, actually works. Um, forgive me if you already know this, I'm going to um, uh, like talk about a little bit of basic concepts, um, but uh, please bear with me. I just want everyone to be on the same page. Uh, I'm going to go into more advanced topics that um, unless you've dealt very deeply with terminals, maybe uh, uh, like uh, maybe they will be new for you. So first, what's the actual difference between a terminal emulator and a shell? Um, both are applications that run on your operating system and um, uh, like communicate with each other. The terminal emulator is uh, like the black uh, um, uh, window that you open in your operating system. Uh, black or white, depending on your theme, and uh, like it's in charge of displaying the text on screen, displaying like textual user interfaces and such, uh, and is in charge of the scroll buffer. So if you scroll up and down, if you had a, like a long command and want to scroll up, that's the responsibility of the terminal emulator. Uh, the shell um, gets user input from the terminal emulator, 
spawns different processes such as uh, top or LS and sends its output to the terminal emulator with instructions of how to display it. Both of these are connected by the PTY. Uh, PTY stands for pseudo teletype and it takes the STD in and STD out of the, uh, like both the terminal emulator and the shell and like kind of fuses them together. So zooming in, uh, the PTY is like just a pipe. So uh, it doesn't hold any actual state about um, like uh, what is displayed or what has been displayed and such. The only state that it actually holds is what the window size is. This is, uh, there are some applications that uh, run in the shell or that the shell defers to, for example, uh, um, a Vim and top that draw a textual interface and need to know how big they need to draw the interface, like how many columns and such. And this is something they can query the PTY and the PTY can also send these signals back to the shell. Like there is a, a, a like in POSIX system, there is systems, there is a, like a SIGWINCH uh, a signal that is sent to the shell and tells the shell that the window size has changed. Um, so uh, this is also the responsibility of the PTY. It tells that uh, it sends like operating system signals to the shell and uh, really it's just a pipe that fuses the two. So I want to take like an example of uh, how the two of these communicate. And this will get us into the uh, like uh, NC VT100 Protocol, I guess, to, I guess what one can call it, which is uh, like the, uh, the way the two of these communicate. Um, so um, a VT100, by the way, in case you don't know, is the name of, uh, I think it was one of the first super popular um, uh, physical terminal devices by, by DEC at the end of the 70s and 80s. And it kind of formalized a lot of uh, these instructions that we're going to talk about. So. Um, uh, let's take an example of uh, how the shell displays like colored text on the terminal. The shell sends like this string to the terminal emulator. Uh, this is called a CSI dispatch. CSI stands for command sequence introducer. Um, and uh, this tells the terminal to change the color to blue. If we look a little deeper into the, um, uh, like the CSI itself, we have an escape character after which uh, we have um, uh, like uh, a left square bracket, which uh, uh, is the way that, that the shell specifies that the CSI is starting. Um, then uh, M at the end here is the kind of CSI. This is a styling instruction and 34 is, is a parameter. It's like a function parameter. Uh, 34 tells the emulator to display the, uh, like the following text in what it defines as blue. Uh, because these are things that uh, the terminal emulator can change itself. It's possible to send more specific instructions like with RGB and such, but uh, for simplicity, I chose like the fixed stuff. After this, it sends like plain text, hello, and the terminal emulator displays it in blue. Um, afterwards, we have here another CSI, which tells the uh, terminal that uh, uh, it's another styling instruction, this one to change the style to underscore. And then it sends world, and then world is displayed in blue and underscore. Um, the like important thing to take out from here is that these CSIs and generally the terminal signals are open-ended. So um, it means that these styles will continue until we get uh, an instruction from uh, the shell to reset them. So that's why world is still blue. Um, if you've ever had like a, a terminal application crash on you and then uh, you saw stack trace in uh, a blinking red, then uh, this is the reason. Uh, as you can see in the slide, you can try this yourself with the echo command. Um, you can give it a flag so it doesn't escape all these things. Um, and uh, then you can like play around with styling the terminal. Um, so this is all well and good for like line feed to be able to send a uh, line after line to the terminal and have it display it in a scroll buffer and such. But the terminal also has the ability as I'm sure uh, like you know, to be able to uh, display textual user interfaces, such as um, uh, um, uh, Vim and Top. So 
Aside from styling instructions, we need a few basic things. We need to be able to uh, send cursor movement instructions to tell um, uh, like the terminal to move its cursor to this column and this line. Um, and uh, then we need like uh, box drawing characters. Uh, we can see the table of them uh, here in the picture. Uh, these characters are part of the Unicode standards. So they're like first class characters and they are used in order to draw UIs. You can see some uh, creative examples on the bottom right. Uh, these are all made of characters. Um, in addition, if we want to uh, have um, uh, like uh, programs uh, such as Vim, Nano, that like provide text editing, then we need like something that's called a uh, scroll region. Um, this is mostly if we want to display like uh, a fixed content, like uh, um, a status bar on the bottom or on the top or something of that sort. Um, so uh, why do we need the scroll, the scroll region? If we imagine um, uh, like the scrolling the terminal, like having uh, uh, the line buffer of uh, sending a line and sending another one and adding a new line, when we fill the scroll buffer of the viewport of the terminal, then um, once we add a new line, what actually happens is as you see here, all the lines are shifted uh, like one to the top and uh, an empty line is uh, created on the bottom. Uh, this is nice, but it does like uh, um, present some problem, as we mentioned, for fixed content, because then this happens. If we see here on the left, we have like a, um, a, a like this imagine the fixed content is like status bars on the top and bottom. Um, and, <clears throat> and then when we add new line, they're like shifted upwards. Um, so that's not what we want to do. This is a self portrait, by the way. Uh, so the solution to this is uh, scroll region. Uh, scroll region is like a CSI instruction, just like the styling instructions. This is, uh, as you can see here, uh, the instruction is R. It tells the terminal that uh, from line two to line four uh, is the scroll region. So this is uh, something that needs to be uh, uh, treated just like the scroll buffer, and the terminal does the rest. So whenever a new line is added, assuming the cursor is within the scroll region, then um, uh, like everything above and below it stays the same and like it kind of does the right thing uh, in the middle. Uh, the astute watchers here will notice that um, uh, the uh, CSI instructions in general are one index rather than zero index. And you can imagine how fun it is to, to uh, program if you want to like position lines in a vector, for example. Um, something to keep in mind. So, as we talked a little bit about the theory of uh, how a terminal emulator works, I want to, uh, like, uh, this is some code from Mosaic, because Mosaic also has an internal terminal emulator that we use uh, for the panes themselves. And I want to talk a little bit about how we implemented it. So I'm going to take the uh, annotation spot. Um, so I'm I want to start with how we represent a uh, terminal character. Um, a terminal character is like we, both keep track of the, the char, the character itself, and its style. So um, the reason for this is that as we remembered, uh, as we remember the CSI instructions are open-ended. So um, a terminal character might be uh, like, might have a blue background, for example, but that might be something that happened 200 lines ago. Um, so when we want to render it to the user, um, we don't want to like have to look through all of our scroll buffer in order to figure out what style it is. So we keep track of it on the terminal character. On the other hand, uh, we also don't want uh, to keep these ANSI strings on the terminal character. Um, uh, we want to interpret them. The reason for this is that um, uh, if we kept the string on the terminal character, then each time we allocate a terminal character, it would happen on the heap rather than on the stack. And that like is a very, very big blow for performance. That's how I implemented it at the beginning. Um, and moving to this like sort of structure, uh, like really, really had a performance boost. So um, the character styles here, we have all the kind of styles that kind of like override each other as options. Uh, and the ANSI code structure below them. 
And when we render these characters to the terminal, we kind of try to do it intelligently, not um, uh, like not send uh, a signing instruction for each character because that would be very wasteful, but do like kind of the same as how we got it from the PTY to um, uh, when the characters start being blue, we send the blue CSI and uh, then and then like uh, continue on until it needs to be changed. We can like even diff the, the, the previous style. Uh, these characters are, um, all of them are placed in a row. Um, a row has the, uh, like, uh, the vector of these characters and also a flag of whether it's canonical or not. A canonical row is a row that the terminal told us is a new row, like we got a new line from the terminal. This is important because if you imagine like um, expanding the terminal window and having to like unwrap lines, then we don't want to unwrap, li unwrap lines that are canonical because then you'd have like the something that clearly needs to be the start of the line, like stuck to the line before it, and that's not what you want. Um, so um, moving further up, we have the grid. The grid uh, has the viewport, which is what's displayed currently on the screen in the pane, uh, which is a vector of uh, these rows. We have the lines above and the lines below, which we use for scrolling. <clears throat> and uh, we also keep track of the uh, cursor, which is just a XY coordinate of the cursor on the screen. Um, if we have a scroll region, we keep track of the top and bottom line of the scroll region, and we keep track of the width and height of the grid to be able to like uh, uh, resize it as needed. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, like by the way, feel free to interrupt me with questions and such uh, if anything is unclear. Um, I'm going to take a drink of water and then let this sink in for a moment. And yeah, now if Zoom will give me my mouse back, I will move next. So uh, this is like kind of how a terminal work, works and how it is uh, uh, implemented in Mosaic. Now I want to like move, uh, like zoom out and look at what a terminal multiplexer is. So taking Mosaic as an example, Mosaic uh, takes the place of the shell, but of course it can, the shell can also defer to it, of course, like you can start your terminal and start Mosaic. Um, and it stands between the, uh, like, uh, uh, at, like, between the, on the other side of the PTY from the terminal emulator. Um, so, and then it does the uh, splitting in several PTYs on its own um, and decides, like it takes all that, all the, uh, um, uh, like the ANSI VT100, uh, Vertex, et cetera, instructions that we get from the PTY, creates an internal state and then decides how to draw that state to the terminal emulator. Uh, so if something changed, for example, in uh, this bit, ah, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so if, there we go. So if something changed uh, in this pane, then it would go to, um, like if we got something on the PTY, like a new character was added, it would go to that part of the screen where it knows the X, Y coordinate of the pane and it would enter the, uh, like, uh, the character there. Um, what we also see here is the plugins that I um, uh, like kind of touched on before. The plugins don't have their own PTY. They're just, uh, they just talk, have an internal API that we use to communicate with Mosaic. And we don't need to, to uh, like have the uh, uh, operating system in charge of our communication pipe. We just do it uh, uh, on our own. So, um, yeah. Um, so if we look uh, at the architecture of uh, Mosaic itself, like we zoom into the Mosaic part of that diagram, then Mosaic is built out of um, like three main threads. Um, there's the STD in threads, which is in charge of uh, like getting the user input from keyboard or mouse. The PTY thread, which is in charge of opening all these PTY connections with the operating system, keeping track of them. It has like async streams that it uses in order to read them so they won't block each other if like we get a lot of characters in one of them. Uh, and we have the screen thread, <coughs> which is in charge both of deciding what should be on screen, 
which is the focus tab, which terminals should be drawn, and also of keeping track of the state of these terminals. So when I say state, I mean uh, what text is displayed in them, um, uh, like if you have a, a top window open, then uh, how it looks, all the characters that make it up and such. Everything that we can use in order to render this to the, uh, to the, user term, the user's terminal. Um, when I created this, I elected not to use shared memory in the form of like uh, Arc Mutex, but instead for uh, all of these to communicate with like uh, uh, MPSC channels. Uh, in case you haven't used MPSC in the past, it stands for uh, multi producer single consumer. Uh, it's a way to send uh, messages fast in memory uh, without having to, like, uh, for example, with an Arc Mutex, you have to like lock a certain part of memory and only one thread can interact with it at the time at a time and when another thread wants to talk to it it has to like uh, wait for it to be released um, so this is both so that using an mpsc it just shoots the message uh, it's both faster uh, like it's more performant which is especially important if we really imagine the relationship uh, between the cpy and the screen like imagine you're tailing a long file and like Characters keep coming all the time. Uh, you, you don't want to like have any locks there. Um, uh, but it's also uh, uh, it's also like kind of critical if we want to eventually move these threads to different processes. Um, so like it would be much easier to already be able to just switch out the MPC channel for uh, IPC, for example. Um, let's take a look at an example of uh, like. Uh, uh, an action that can happen and uh, how like, it moves between the threads. So we start with the STDN thread. We get uh, control DM. It's kind of a temporary shortcut. We're still working out the shortcut. What it means is open a new pane um, wherever. Like don't split anything horizontally or vertically, just uh, um, uh, find the largest free space and open a pane there. Um, so the SDN thread figures out this is a command that is directed at uh, Mosaic. Um, it um, uh, like sends a message through the MPSC channel to the PTY thread, telling it to spawn a new terminal. The PTY thread uh, adds a new terminal to the list and then sends a message to the screen thread, telling it I added a new like it's like it basically forwards the message, like tell the screen thread, hey, I added a new uh, pain, uh, this is its ID, do your thing with it. Uh, so the screen uh, 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 thread finds the uh, like largest empty space and sends them, uh, like a message back to the PTY thread telling it uh, resize this ID to this uh, size. Um, you'll remember that this is important because uh, the PTY, uh, one of the states that it keeps is uh, like how large the, uh, like the terminal window is so that uh, like UIs will be able to query it. Uh, so then PTY thread uh, talks to the OS and tells it to uh, uh, like change the uh, size of the, size of the, uh, of the like PTY that it opened before. Um, so uh, this is one example. We can also imagine like an example with the STD in thread communicating directly with the screen thread. For example, if we want to resize a pane, um, so uh, it would send this command to the screen thread, and then the screen thread would send the, re would send the resize to the PTY. Um, this was all. Uh, uh, this is like uh, uh, nice, but um, like. After I, I created this, when other developers started uh, hacking on the project, then this like uh, it started to be a little bit confusing, uh, especially if you're a developer that uh, isn't like intimately familiar with how the app works, and you get like a, a stack trace, like a crash. If we can um, uh, like imagine in this process, like say the screen thread crashes because of an integer overflow or whatever. Um, you, the stack trace that you'll get only uh, uh, represents stuff that happen with, it happens within the screen thread. So um, you don't really know this whole story of where the message got and what initiated this and uh, such. It can be like more complex examples than this. And generally, like debugging it is not the, the, the funnest thing in the world. So uh, one of the people, one of the other people on the team implemented um, a, like an error handling uh, mechanism for this. What we did 
is we took the MPSC senders, we uh, wrapped them in like kind of our own custom struct that you can see here. Um, and uh, we kept the same API, so we can still use them to send messages to other threads exactly as you, uh, as you could before. But you can also update them with a custom error context. Um, an error context, like it's not displayed here, but it's basically like just a, a textual lines of, um, uh, or enums that can be deserialized into textual lines, serialized, sorry, um, of like, um, uh, I got keyboard input, I came uh, uh, here, I opened uh, a new PTY, um, I opened a new pane. And this is like kind of forwarded between threads. And whenever we get uh, uh, an error, then we forward the uh, error context into a panic hook so that we are able to display like kind of a, a nice uh, story before the uh, uh, like the stack trace of uh, what led us here to be able to uh, like uh, more easily debug this. Um, so, um, moving on. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about uh, what I alluded to since the beginning of the stock, which is our WebAssembly plugin system. Um, so um, the reason we chose WebAssembly is that uh, if we want to write uh, plugins for um, um, like for Mosaic, we don't want to have to like, uh, if you can imagine the status bar, for example, which is a plugin that we saw before, um, we don't want to have to um, like recompile Mosaic in order to load it, in order to add more functionality. Um, so WebAssembly allows, uh, allows us to like pre-compile Rust code into a WebAssembly asset and then load it at runtime uh, into like into an application. So uh, the UI for this can be as easy as taking a URL of a WebAssembly asset in like a GitHub releases somewhere, loading it into your application, giving it permissions, and then you have a pane. You're already running application. Um, it would like WebAssembly also allows us to uh, uh, like uh, as I said, write plugins in any compiled language. Um, this is like especially useful if you want to take existing applications and uh, turn them into plugins. Uh, and it also gives us built-in sandboxing. So uh, applications would uh, also not be able to like affect other part of the application of the Mosaic application uh, uh, only through API and also uh, not affect, not easily affect uh, other parts of the system like, uh, like the, 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 the uh, let the computer do like uh, rm minus rf slash and such. Um, so how does it actually work? Um, in our philosophy, each plugin is a separate pane, like you've seen with the status bar, for example. Uh, if you want to have an experience that is um, um, multiple panes, then you write two plugins that communicate with each other or one plugin that you open twice and does like different things depending on what it is. Uh, we have like a message, or we plan to have like message buses and, uh, and such. This the WebAssembly system has been merged into main, uh, I think two or three weeks ago. So everything is like kind of new and shiny. Um, you write a Rust application or a Go application or a assembly script application or a C++ application. And um, uh, then that application um, just renders itself through SCD out. It can be as simple as a print state statement, or it can use all the NC ZT100 uh, uh, goodies that we talked about before. Um, if you want to do that, I would warmly recommend using a framework, which would make your life a little bit easier. Uh, if we're in Rust world, I very much recommend TUI, which is a really cool terminal UI framework. Um, and in order to have this compiled WebAssembly asset interact with the operating system, we use something that's called WASI. In case you haven't heard of it, I think, don't like, catch me on this, I think it stands for WebAssembly Server Interface. And this allows uh, the application to use its native uh, like file system interaction module um, and uh, talk to the operating system, but only to the parts that you give it permission to talk. Um, 
So um, if I'm using it to code, I would only give it permission to talk to the uh, like uh, um, to, to my repo essentially to the place on my hard drive in which I hold it. And then like if it does crazy stuff, I have uh, um, I have it all I have it all uh, in GitHub or in Git somewhere. One should hope. Um, right now we tried uh, and it works with uh, interacting with the file system. In the future, we hope, I'm just not sure what the state of WASI is in this uh, uh, area, but we hope to have it interact with a network, for example, and other like uh, OS layer stuff. To give an example of this, um, I'm going to start Mosaic with uh, like a, a, a layout that loads a plugin. That's right now, that's our way to, use, to load plugins and so we'll create some sort of UI that does it. If you remember from the, at the beginning of the talk, I showed my uh, development environment and I showed like uh, um, Ranger, which is the file system explorer. Our first plugin written by a member of the team is called Strider, uh, which is a Ranger clone. As you might notice, we are a little bit of uh, Tolkien geeks. Um, and um, Strider, this is a WebAssembly plugin that um, uh, is not running on the operating system. It's running like as part of Mosaic. And one can use it to like explore the file system, go up, go down, and even use an API in order to uh, open panes in Mosaic. Uh, what happened here is that the API sends the open new pane command with a file path. And Mosaic used the uh, system's default editor, in my case, it's Vim, in order to open a pane where it has the most space. Uh, we can do that. We can open one. Uh, we can open, like, uh, I don't know, this one, for example, and it uh, opens new pane, and we can do, like, all the things with that. So, um, uh, this is about how we do it with, uh, uh, like, um, uh, WebAssembly and what we have right now. These are the two plugins right now in existence, but uh, in the future, like one can imagine a lot of stuff that we can do with plugins. Uh, personally, the, uh, the plugin that I'm uh, most excited about, that I hope someone will write in the future, or maybe I will get to it, is like have a Rust Analyzer or a Cargo Check. Uh, like, if you can imagine, sometimes uh, if I, uh, like when I write Rust, I sometimes uh, get uh, a, a use after move or use after uh, borrow uh, error. And uh, the error is like awesome, but sometimes the lines are like 100, 150 lines apart, and then I have to like track it and go up and down and uh, uh, such. Uh, so uh, I can imagine a plugin that I would able to interact with and press, and then it opens a pane with uh, like my default editor on the line of the error open several panes and saying the error happened here, here, and here, um, and you know, imagination is the limit. Um, I'm not going to go very deep into this code, um, uh, but uh, this is, um, uh, I, I just wanted to show like uh, the example plugin, which is our status bar. Um, and I mostly wanted to show you that uh, like it has um, a kind of not very trivial functionality that is written in very little lines of code, because Mosaic does a lot of the stuff. It has pagination. Uh, it has like a conditional rendering of uh, like it renders uh, uh, different stuff depending on the size of the pane that it is, that's, which is comes from the signs of the terminal window, um, and it interact it, it interacts with user inputs. Um, we have currently a library for Rust for writing plugins. We call it um, Mosaic Tile, um, which gives you a trait that you can implement. And uh, once implementing that trait, it has like in it to do some like startup stuff and then draw, which is called every time um, uh, like uh, that Mosaic needs to render you. And it gives you like the size and such, and also allows you to handle keys and, so and such. Um, this is all on GitHub. You can check it out. Uh, um, like there is a link. Um, something else that we want to do with our architecture. I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture that uh, uh, terminal multiplexers, Tmux, for example, can do like a sort of uh, client-server thing, uh, which allows you to connect to a session, work, open panes, do your stuff, uh, and then detach from it, close the terminal window open the terminal window again, reattach to the session and continue your work. 
this is especially powerful if you're um, like on a, a remote server, for example. Um, this also has the added benefit of allowing more than one client to connect to the same session. So um, if we can imagine creative uses for this, then like my favorite is obviously peer programming. I think it can be really fun for two or more people to connect to uh, like uh, the same place and work not only on the same code base, but on the same code in real time to be able to like uh, go to a tab of my friends and seeing uh, what they're working on um, in real time, like as they type. Um, and also like if we imagine having um, uh, like plugins that facilitate this, then uh, like Mosaic can actually help you do this. For example, we can imagine a plugin that uh, um, like knows when one person is editing a struct and another person is editing the implementation of that struct. And then it can like give a certain warning, change the color of the status bar or something, tell you, hey, um, maybe you want to like check with the other person to make sure you're not like uh, contradicting each other. Um, and uh, uh, yeah. I think the fun thing about the plugin system is that uh, probably the coolest plugins are the ones that um, I do not think about, but the people implementing them will. In the future, um, like this kind of gets into uh, like science fiction territory because these are things that I hope will happen. I have a general idea about how they can happen, but um, uh, like I don't see it yet. I'm saying it here not because I'm saying this is like my plan. Uh, or my roadmap. I'm saying this is something that I want to happen and I hope is possible. So just to have the right disclaimer about it. Um, I would like to have different adapters for Mosaic. Um, at first, to be able to connect to it, not just through a terminal emulator, but uh, through, for example, there are specific terminal emulators, if you know them, like Terminator and iTerm2, which like kind of have their own uh, uh, like multiplexer pain thing, which is part of the application itself. Um, and um, uh, I think it can be cool to have that backed by Mosaic so that in the Terminator or iTerm2 panes, one can see the same thing with another person connected to that session and terminal. Um, I also think it can be cool to do the same thing with like uh, Econ the X Windows desktop environment to be able to uh, um, uh, open different terminal windows uh, for each terminal pane of the session that you're connected to. And maybe if we're taking the plugins, maybe we can even find some way to interpret the textual user interface into an actual interface that will be displayed on X windows if one is connected with that client. Um, and maybe even then find a way, I find a way to write a VS Code plugin that would like kind of sync it with a mosaic session, and then one person can use VS Code, and another, another person can use a terminal emulator and such. Um, I would also like to extend the layout system. Uh, currently, we have a layout system in Mosaic that one can like start it with an argument to a YAML file. The YAML file describes um, like um, uh, a layout, uh, which is how I want my panes to be arranged on the screen. Um, I would like to extend it and create some sort of language that would allow one to, for example, borrow a page from uh, like uh, web development and be able to change uh, the layout depending on the size of the screen. So when we resize the terminal window, not just to have uh, like the panes resize themselves relative to how they were before, but for example, we say, okay, if this thing becomes too narrow and it doesn't make sense to show it, maybe we'll like move it down or um, uh, like maybe we'll remove it entirely and have some like uh, text message saying there is another pane here that is hidden. Do you like scroll to access it or, or whatever? Um, another idea that I've had uh, is to use Mosaic in order to uh, facilitate uh, rendering like images and video in the terminal. Uh, maybe you've seen this in some terminal emulators support uh, letting you do like cat to uh, um, a PNG or a GIF image, and then having it displayed in the terminal. Uh, I haven't dealt with this, uh, like with the implementation of this directly, but as far as I could figure out, uh, there are a few different ways of doing this. 
Um, and if you want to write an application, you need to like either choose to support one or um, uh, like depending on the terminal emulator of the people using your application and the operating system and, and such. Uh, so you have, have to either support one or detect what it is that the user is running and then like kind of support all of them uh, like we used to do in browsers in the past. Uh, so I think it can be cool for Mosaic to kind of like I would not want to create another protocol, but I would like to uh, um, be able to like make it easier to support all of them in one way or another. Um, so this is kind of how I envision the uh, the future architecture of Mosaic, having several clients of uh, several kinds connected to the same Mosaic instance, running uh, several sessions. So some of these clients can be collaborating, some of them can be like. Uh, uh, working independently and uh, Mosaic having like different connecting to different shells and PTYs and plugins and such. Uh, it can also be on a remote server. Um, it can conceivably even be a service on the net that you connect to, uh, keep your sessions and such. So after we talked about um, uh, like the idea behind Mosaic, what it is now, we've shown some, dem some demos, uh, went to the technical parts, uh, like every open source project and every like project in general has like kind of a story behind it. So I want to share you a little bit of, uh, how the beginning of Mosaic was for me. Um, when I started creating it, uh, like a month or two months after it, uh, like the task was daunting. It was big, it was far bigger than I thought it was, than I thought it would be, as happens a lot to us software developers, as I'm sure you can relate. Um, and um, I wasn't close to giving up, but I was very frustrated. So I talked to a friend uh, who is now, uh, like, he was the second ever maintainer of Mosaic. And uh, he advised me to open the project up. Just take it as is, make it public, Get other people involved. Um, I eventually took his advice, uh, but it was one of the harder things that I did um, because, um, you know, of course, the project is not ready. It can't be uh, shared before it is ready, um, but um, that was, wasn't the right way to think about it. Um, sharing the project allowed other people to get involved, um, uh, like kind of on the ground level, um, and made the project like not mine but uh, a team effort. Uh, it would not be close to where it is today. Uh, uh, without the team, it probably would not be. Um, so uh, I'm incredibly grateful to that advice, and I want to give that advice to you. If you take nothing else from this talk, um, please uh, uh, remember that if you have a project uh, and you're kind of frustrated about it, before giving up on it, open it up. Like, when I opened Mosaic up, it was like, there were some fi files which were 2,000 lines of code long. It was like, really, I, I was, I, I kept feeling that I have to apologize for this code, but that's not, in my opinion, that's not the right way to think about it. Um, get other people involved, um, uh, like don't work alone. Um, as promised, some problems that we're working on today uh, where the project is. Uh, I'm mostly concentrating on uh, fixing uh, so-called compatibility issues, which is uh, places where uh, like you would work with Mosaic, you would work with like uh, lots of different panes and uh, run stuff in the panes, and then stuff would either crash or um, not behave correctly. The colors would be wrong, the lines would be wrong and such. So I'm fixing these, like squashing them one by one. This effort is kind of close to its end. When like Mosaic, like it's a, uh, like I, I'm saying this carefully, but it's starting to be in a pretty stable place. But there's still work to do here if there's something that interests you. Uh, I would also want to um, uh, flesh out the layout system. As I mentioned before, doing all the like uh, conditional layout and creating a, a, like a domain language inside of the YAML files. Uh, I think it can be like a pretty fun project. Um, I have the idea of uh, like uh, supporting multiple terminal windows for session. So if you have like multiple screen for, screens, for example, you can open a terminal emulator in each one of the screens, drag the panes between them, kind of figure that out. Um, I think that can be a fun thing to do. Uh, and then of course, um, 
more plugins. Uh, in the team, we had ideas for like a chat plugin that would allow people connecting to the same uh, uh, pane to chat. If we get uh, WASI networking support uh, uh, to happen, then uh, maybe even connecting to different chat clients and having them in Mosaic. Uh, there is the Rust Analyzer uh, plugin that I mentioned. Um, uh, people on the team also want like a Kubernetes cluster explorer. So if you have like a Kubernetes cluster, you would load its configuration into Mosaic and it would uh, like open things to all the right places and such. And you like, uh, I think it like can be a fun way to onboard other people onto the team. And of course, as I mentioned, I think the best ideas are ones that um, uh, like neither me nor people that currently on the team uh, will be the ones to think about. Um, I would like to end with this quote from my favorite software philosopher, uh, Douglas Adams, who wrote in A Salmon of Doubt, should not have to be tyrannized by application developers who don't know the first thing about how actual people do their actual work. We should be able to just pick up the bits we like and paste them in. And I think it can be pretty cool if uh, this becomes like a, a workspace that people use can just take part of applications that they want, paste them in, and uh, work the way they want. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for to Russ Lins for uh, uh, like uh, having me. Thank you for your time for listening to this talk. If Mosaic is something that interests you, please visit us. Uh, I'm Avan. You can follow me on Twitter. I sometimes like write about um, uh, like terminal stuff um, or on GitHub. Um, and uh, yeah, please join by. Uh, we also have a Discord server if you want to um, uh, like learn more about the project and how you can get involved. We're a friendly and welcoming bunch. No matter your experience level, we will be happy to have you. And I'll try to stick around on the um, like uh, uh, Rustin's Discord server in case you want to talk to me or have questions or you can ask me right now. Yeah, thank you very much.